Hi everyone, my name is Eleni and I will be talking to you today about GoRoutines and thread safe data structures. Before we begin, uh, one concept that is really useful to clarify is the difference between what a program is versus what a process is versus what a thread is. So a program, uh, when we talk about the, a program, is the lines of code that we write, usually on our IDE, we store the file on our laptop or computer, but only actually gets to become a process when it is executed on our laptop or server. So a process is tied with the operating system and it has its own memory space. The memory space is what we use in order to store variables, to manage communication, and many other things. A process can have more than one thread, and it can use threads in order to delegate responsibility for running part of our program. We are going to talk a little bit about threads today, uh, but one useful thing to remember is that threads share the same memory because they all belong to the same process. Another useful concept to clarify is the difference between parallelism and concurrency. When we talk about parallelism, we are talking about things that are executed at exactly the same time. When we talk about concurrency, the concept is a bit different and it means being able to deal with more than one thing at the same time, but not necessarily executing them at the exact same point. Why would you be interested in concurrency and parallelism? The main reason why we work with concurrency and parallelism is because it helps us utilize our processing power a lot better. It also allows us to reduce by a lot the execution time of our programs and it reduces the perceived time it takes for a program to complete. In this presentation, we are going to use an example and our example is going to be a supermarket. For a supermarket, we have one counter where everybody that shops into our supermarket needs to uh, queue in order to process the items that they have in their basket in order to be able to check out. So if we were to look at the code that we are going to use, we are going to have one struct, which is the person, and a person has an ID and an integer that represents the number of items in that person's um, basket. We're going to also use a counter. A counter, again, has a unique ID, and it also has a registry, which represents the total cost of all the items that we have checked out in that counter. There's also one list associated with the counter, and this is a Hold the references of all the people that have been served in this count. Finally, we have the queue, and the queue represents the list of people that we have in the supermarket that have items in their basket that we want to check out. The queue is basically a slice uh, of pointers referring to people that we have uh, created whilst we are running the program. If we were to look now in more detail, what does the person track look like? Apart from the two attributes that we mentioned, the ID and the number of items, it, we also have two functions. We have the total cost, and the total cost is there to calculate the, the total amount that the items in the basket actually cost, and the processing cycles, which is a, an auxiliary function that we use to introduce a little bit of a delay whilst we are processing items at the counter. Looking into the total cost in about a bit more detail, we see that what we actually do is we process through the number of items and we generate a random integer that represents the price for that item. And at the end, we add all those prices together and we return the value to the caller. Processing cycles is a lot simpler. It's just an artificial uh, delay that we introduce. Again, it's dependent on the number of items and this is for us to be able to fluctuate a little bit the processing time depending on the items that we have on the basket. If we were to look at the counter, the counter has two functions. It has the process function and it has the people ID. The process function accepts a person as a parameter and what it does, apart from doing the artificial delay that we mentioned before on the processing, it appends that person to the people being served by this counter and it also adds the total cost of the basket for this person into the registry, which is the amount of money that this registry has actually collected. People IDs is a much smaller function. It takes, it looks through all the people that have been processed by this uh, counter and it just creates a list with just the IDs. This is going to be useful as we're going to see later on because there are a number of debugging functions in the program that we are going to run. And this helps us just print the IDs of the people. It makes it a little bit easier to see the debugging. 
finally, we have the queue. A queue has three uh, functions. It has a pop, a push, and a number of people. Um, pop is pretty standard. So when we want to ex uh, extract a person from the queue, we want our queue to behave in a first in, first out uh, way. So we always extract from the top of the queue, so the first person that we added. So this function is checking, do we still have people in the queue? If yes, then it creates, uh, it extracts the first person and it returns a slice of the remaining people, which replaces the internal um, attribute that we have of people. If there are no people in the queue, this will actually return nil to the caller. Push is a lot simpler because it just performs an append operation to the queue. So when we add a new person in the queue, they just get appended to the list of people that we have. Number of people just returns the length of the list of people that we have in our queue. So these are the structs that we are going to use for our program. Um, if you want to follow through, there is also a, a GitHub repository that has all the code. Um, it includes the GoRoutines app. The app runs in different modes as we are going to gradually be building on top of the examples that we are going to go through today. Um, it also uh, has some additional logging functions that are going to help us understand what happens on each of the stages that we're going to see in the presentation, as well as some additional initialization functions that help us create, for example, counters for our supermarket app. It helps us create people and populate the queue with those people. So let's go through our first example here. Our first example is going to be a sequential run of our program. So no routines, no threads, nothing so far. We just have a counter, we have a queue, we have people being added to the queue, and we want to run this program. If we use the app, if you download it from the GitHub repo, you can do go run sequential and verbose. Sequential is the type of run that we want to do. Verbose is going to give us the extra output. And we're going to see that we run the supermarket app with one counter. The counter has an ID of zero. It processed 50 people from our queue with IDs from zero to 49. Looking at the code of how we write this piece of code, we have a function which is the run supermarket sequential. It accepts the context, a queue object, a, a counter object, and then we have a for loop. For as long as the number of people in the queue is greater than zero, pop the next person from the queue, process it, and complete. You will also see in this example that there are three lines of code that are grayed out. And these are a way that we have, or should I say a way that Go provides that we can use to start uh, creating trace outputs uh, of what has happened during the execution of our program. This is a very, very powerful way of looking at what is uh, the inner workings of one of our Go applications. And what we are doing here is we are creating a new task and we are uh, creating an items event that holds the number of items for the current person that we are processing from the queue. If you haven't come across Go's trace tool, I definitely recommend having a look. Super useful tool. Many, many uh, things that you can see from that tool and it's very easy to use. Um, again, if we do this run for our program, because we created those lines, those three lines that we saw in the previous slide, the output of the program was also going to be a file called trace.out. Trace.out will have all the login that we did throughout the execution of our program. Using Go's trace tool, you can do go to trace, pass in the trace.out file that got generated as the output of our program. And this will actually parse the file and it will create a web view uh, of the results of the parsing. So this is what we see at the bottom line. If you run this, it will pop up on your browser. If it doesn't, you can copy and paste the URL that you see at the bottom there. If you look at the result of that, this is what you're going to see. So this is the output from the trace tool, and it has different sections. The first section is up here, which is going to be the one that we are going to be very interested in today because it's going to show us the routines, the Go routines that we are using. There is a bottom here which shows us how many processes we have. And there is the right part here, which actually show us how many events of each type did we trigger throughout the execution. Um, just as a reminder, we have a queue with 50 people. And what we see on the right is that we have 
um, nine events with eight items in a person's basket. We have seven events with two items in the, the person's basket and so on and so forth. So this is very useful debugging output that we can see over there. So far, pretty standard. We created our uh, queue, we created our counter, we processed the people in the queue. So let's start now talking about go routines. A go routine is, as I say, is a lightweight thread that is managed by the go runtime. So the go runtime is what actually maps the operating system thread um, to uh, what go can actually use. So the runtime is responsible for mapping go routines to be executed on the threads. And usually what we have is we have more go routines than threads. And it is go that does the scheduling of what runs when. Why do we call them lightweight? They are very, very easy to write and very, very easy to implement in our code. Um, the only thing that we need to do, actually two things that we need to do, we need to define a function, and then we just need to use the keyword go. And this will actually create a go routine for us. If we were to see how that looks like in our code, we extracted the logic that we had before, which is our for loop, and we created a function which is called process queue. Again, it gets the context, it gets the queue, it gets a counter with the logic of what we want to do and the uh, output that we want to send to our trace tool. And if we look now at the function that is going to trigger, is going to be triggered by our app, um, we see that we have replaced the body of this function with the keyword go plus the call to the processing function with the parameters that we want to do. So this is all it takes really to create a go routine. It's very easy, very lightweight, um, and we just extract the logic, put it in a function, prefix the call with the keyword go, and we are set. Let's run this now. If we do run this, we are going to see that the execution of go run one routine verbose is again going to run successfully, which is good news. It's going to create the debugging output, and we're going to see that we indeed, we again, we have one counter, counter zero, but it seems that it has processed none of the people that actually were in our supermarket queue. If we look at the output in the trace tool, similar result, we are going to see that something happened. We had a period of time where we actually did see uh, the go routine running, but the output doesn't actually match. We don't see the items on the right, so we only see one. We don't see anything else, so we definitely don't see 50, which is rather strange. So why did this happen? How did we end up in this situation? This happened because we delegated responsibility from our main program to our Go routine. But we didn't actually know, has the execution started of the Go routine? Has the execution finished inside our Go routine? Is our code still running? We don't have a way to know that because we have delegated all of that responsibility in the Go routine. So the program went, I'm going to run, delegate responsibility, nothing else for me to do, let's exit. We need something better for that. So enter the scene is goes wait groups. The wait groups is a, is all, is a contract provided by Go, um, and it will help us do synchronization, basically. Go has a package which is called sync, and as part of that package, we have the wait groups. Uh, we can introduce a wait group in our run supermarket function, as you see it at the bottom there. We, in, we just instantiate a new uh, object, uh, and we, before we call our go routine, we add one to the wait group. The add one, which is this line over here, is what will say to the waiting group that there is something that is going to execute that we need to wait for. Inside our processing function, we are going to make a call to waiting group done. We pass the waiting group, as you see in the definition of the function, and then we call waiting group done using the defer, which means that this will actually only get called once the execution of the entire function has completed. And then the last thing that we need to do is actually tell our main program that we need to wait for our waiting group. What waiting group dot done will do is it will reduce this counter once the execution of the function is done. 
And this will allow our program to actually block and wait until the Go routine has returned successfully to the execution of the main program. Let's run it again. To do this again, go run one time, one routine and wait, verbose. We are going to see the output again, one counter with an ID zero, 50 people successfully processed with IDs of zero to 49. So looking at the trace tool again, we have the process, processes at the bottom, go routines at the top. We can see the processing of all the items on the right, which is our debugging from our trace tool. And this is really interesting. So what we have done so far is we have read, written our program, we run it sequentially. We have decided to use go routines to delegate the processing to a go routine. And we have used wait groups to wait for the go routine to complete before we exit our program. Let's take it one step further. Let's say now that we want to take advantage of the goal things that we have just started using. And instead of having one, we want to have many. In this example, the way that we would do that is by creating more counters and reading from the same queue. This would mean that we could quickly start picking people from the queue and the processing will complete uh, a lot faster. The way that we can do that, very, very easy, in our run supermarket with n go routines, instead of passing one uh, counter, we are passing a list of counters. We are using our wait group. And instead of doing uh, spawning just one go routine, we are going to spawn as many go routines as many counters we have. The only thing to remember here is that we do need to add all the go routines as well on our waiting group. And we only need to have one wait call because we would wait until all of the goal routines have made a call to uh, waiting group dot done. Changes here, the list, second change here, which is the for loop. And then everything should work, right? But everything doesn't work, at least doesn't work all the time. What we have seen if we execute this a number of times is we are going to see that we run into what we call some race conditions. We call them race conditions because they don't actually manifest all the time. So it could be that you have to run this program 100 times or 200 times for you to be able to see all of the cases that we are going to talk about in the next few slides. So race condition number one. First thing that we're going to see is we're going to see that we have added in our program this time to sleep that makes it on purpose slow down after it has entered the for loop. If we run this, we are going to get a panic. And the panic that we're going to get is this line, which says runtime error, invalid memory address, or nil pointer dereference. And the line that actually triggers that in our code is this one, which is very interesting. So the reason why this happens is because from the point we entered the for loop, we said, if there are more people in the queue, we wait. There are other go routines executing at the same time, which means that before we are actually able to get a person from the queue using the queue.pop, something else or other go routines have actually emptied the queue. Remember from earlier on when we said how the pop function works, if there are items, if there are people in the queue, they are going to be returned. If there is nothing in the queue, we are going to get nil. And this is what happened here. When we entered the loop, there were items in the people in the queue. We tried to pop. There was nothing there. Our p variable is actually nil. So when we tried to log p.items, p is nil. So there is no items there. Let's try something else. Again, let's try running this and see another race condition from the same piece of code. This is the sec a second attempt running this. We do go run and routines, again verbose. This time, different error. This code does compile, but it doesn't run. And if you see uh, the line where this happens is this one. Um, it says panic, runtime error, slice, bounce out of range, one to zero. And this is basically this line over here, if you look at the top right corner. 
what happened here is we made the call to a um, number of people. Again, we did have people in the queue. We make a call to pop. We enter the pop function. There are still people in the queue, which is good. We enter the if statement. But by the time we actually reach the line where we process the slices, the slice is actually empty. So there is nothing there to pop. Again, this code compiles, but it doesn't run, at least not always. Another race condition. This is a, a yet another case where something might go wrong with the code that we have written. We do the run, we get the output, and the example now is quite different. We've managed to run our supermarket app, this time with 10 go routines and the waiting group. We can see the counters going from zero to nine, 10 counters. We can see the IDs of the people processed by each counter. And we also see an extra line of output at the bottom, which is this one. People processed more than once, six and 13. This is a very tricky race condition. And the reason being that it's not actually erring, it is doing a processing of some people more than one time, which means that we're actually double counting. If you look at these two lines, you are going to see that counter one and counter eight both think that they process person with ID number six. If you look at these two lines, counters two and five think they processed a person with ID 13. Again, this is the code that makes us do that. And it does compile, it does run, it may or may not happen, and it double processes some of the people in our queue. Again, pretty impressive, right? Let's have a look at, um, so, sorry, so that was the, the last one. Uh, so it double processes, which is a bad thing to happen uh, because that means that we wouldn't know because it doesn't error. The impressive thing with this code is that with us introducing just two lines of code, we actually managed to introduce four race conditions. And there is one more race condition that happens uh, in some cases where we don't only double process some people, we may encounter cases where we haven't processed everybody. So that would be the fourth race condition I'm referring to here. In any case, pretty impressive that we managed to have four race conditions with such a little uh, piece of code that we've written. And that is why it's very important for us to know what to look for when we are working with uh, Go teams. So how can we do things better? The next thing that we are going to talk about is mutexes and locks. This is again part of the sync package that uh, Go already provides. And a mutex is the thing that we are going to introduce in our queue. We are adding here one more attribute in our queue, which is called the lock. And it is a, a mutex that we introduce from the sync package. Mutual actually st stands for uh, mutual exclusion. And what we want to do here is avoid running into the race conditions that we did before, where we have more than one go routines trying to access the same data structure at the same time and reading back inconsistent results. So what we accomplish by using a mutex is we can actually lock the structure for operations that alter the structure. So in this case, when we want to read from the structure, um, we can lock it, uh, we can amend, change the structure, and then we can release the lock, which wouldn't keep things consistent between all of our Go routines. One thing to keep in mind, of course, is that when we do use locks, this does have an impact on the execution time because not every, everyone will be able to, at the same time, read the same things. It does make things, though, consistent, which is what we are aiming for here. Let's have a look at the process queue function. The way that this is changing now is by us introducing the lock in the queue and before we do the read operation on the number of people, we lock the queue so nothing can change the, the structure while we are reading it. And we unlock at the bottom. So basically, we lock before we read, we do the pop, and then we unlock. And we do the same thing inside our for loop. Again, here is the same block. We lock, we read the number of people, we pop the person, and then we unlock. 
if we look at how this looks like in our trace tool, this is a slightly different output now, but we can see down here that we have multiple Go routines running, and we can see here that we do see different parts of our program being executed in different um, during the time period that our program actually runs, which is pretty impressive. So if we were to summarize, what did we talk about today? We talked about uh, processes, threads, and Go routines. We talked about weight groups that help us synchronize our main program with the Go routines that we are introducing and executing. And we talked about the different race conditions that we can see if we just use uh, Go routines and we are not aware of these intricacies of how our code changed by us introducing Go routines. And finally, we talked about mutexes and locks, which is a way for us to be able to safely read from the same data structure in order to avoid race conditions happening uh, that are very hard to detect. So that was all from me. Thank you all for listening. Um, a few details about myself here and just the GitHub where you can get the code and you can have a look at uh, the actual functions and uh, debugging output. Thank you.